Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to be discussing my philosophy of writing. Now, you may think that it's kind of just a, a trivial thing to talk about specifically a philosophy of writing. And when I say that, I mean kind of a way to do writing. I don't mean a philosophy of writing in or as a subset of the philosophy of language. Um, I don't mean the technicalities of writing particularly or too much. Um, but I mean more so, can we determine a natural or correct way to write and to engage with writing? Um, and so, obviously, it's going to bleed into the philosophy of language slightly. Um, but we're not going to go too much into the real technicalities of um, language, of language pr production, or where language came about, and then ultimately how, la how writing came about from that. We're not going to be going into that side of things too much. But this question of is there a particular way to write has been on my lips for quite a while. And the reason most questions are on my lips are because of something that we all like to call idealism. And why we all like to feel as if there is this particular right way of doing something. And so you look at people in the past or you look at certain structures and rules of doing things that we have in the present and you wish to atone with those and you wish to understand those and you wish to fulfill those in the best way possible it's very much with uh like with poetry now really there isn't any rules to poetry really on the base of it but we have this kind of structured set of rules depending on wh what sort of poem you're doing whether you're doing a haiku or whether you're doing nonsense poetry or whether you're doing prose poetry or whether you're doing sort of rhyming verse or something like that whether you're doing lim limericks or whatever it is we have some sort of rules there but really there isn't any rules to poetry because we can express ourselves in any way possible poetically now, what you'll find is being able to write within the rules of poetry and express yourself in the way you wish to is one of the best ways of going, going about it. Because at first, you may try and cling to the rules of poetry and try and put words in certain places and try and be very, very rigid with it. If, let's say, you're a person who um, kind of likes to follow rules, like I am particularly, I quite, I'm quite agreeable, I like to do things in a certain way that's, let's say, highlighted to me. Um, so if you are a person like that, at first you're going to think about the rules and you're going to be quite rigid with it. Then you're going to go the total opposite and you're going to go to the total extreme of not having any rules and then you're going to find some sort of happy medium. Now is that to say that in poetry that happy medium is the correct medium? We don't know. But this is what I want to get onto with the philosophy of writing. There's all these many right ways of doing it but we don't we can never fully understand the right way and we only wish to understand the right way because we have an attachment to the right way. We have an attachment to doing it in a certain manner. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that because we want to do the best work that we can do. But sometimes having or being overly attached to the right way of doing something, it means that you don't do it in the way that 
you have at your disposal and the way in which would be the most creative direction for you as an individual. So we tend to let, let's just go over a few of the ways people can write. You can write just quite naturally or norm or normally we'll say, maybe not exactly naturally, although there is an element of a natural tendency within it, of course. But you can write quite normally as it uh, and you can say to yourself, I'm going to write an essay or I'm going to write a book. And so you, you go off and you write that. But you write it in a certain way that of course you try to write it. You you actually try and you go out there and you're like, right, I'm writing this book and I'm doing it in that way. And you can be quite kind of forceful with your writing. Now, of course, there always has to be a, a spirit attached to an idea in which is the pursuit of that idea. You always have to have some level of passion and spirit to be able to put an idea in reality. But when we write with a lack of spirit in which we just let it flow, generally, though not always, we generally get a nice piece of writing that's almost poetic, even if it's a, a in a book or even if it's in an essay. Um, you can get a nice piece of poetic writing from that natural just letting it flow, that almost compulsion to write and just allow the words to be placed upon the page as they wish. So, of course, you have the, the forced element of writing. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to get this exactly right. I'm going to lay it out in this exact way and I'm going to um, make sure that this is done conscientiously in this way. Now, that form of writing can be very, very good for scientific journals, scientific articles. Um, it can be quite good for certain textbooks and things like that, um, and being able to have that kind of more forceful element of writing. When we talk about the art of writing, that specific style doesn't work as, as well. And if we are also to consider that maybe we would like some flow in a poetic way, let's say, or in a humorous manner within a scientific journal, which is, you know, not the best option, but people can do it and you can do it in a way that is actually still suited to a, to a journal article or whatever it may be. Um, or you may want little things in a particular textbook that are a bit more poetic or a little bit more relatable. And so sometimes with that form of writing, it's, a, it's an odd kind of thing that happens with that. Because what we can think is we have this weird mix there in that idea between the art of writing and also the more forced writing. Because what happens in that circumstance is you set off to write a, a book, a textbook, or a journal article, or whatever it may be, a piece of writing that desires more conscientiousness and desires more attention and is maybe not so much uh, done in a compulsive passion like some forms of poetry can be done and can be done well in that way, or some forms of um, artistic philosophy can be done in that way as well. But you start off with, let's say, this textbook or this journal article, and you're very conscientious and you're very forced. But then maybe you put in it, especially if we're thinking about a textbook, because I've read a few textbooks that we've been given from our course, uh, well, rather chapters of them, rather than the full books. Um, but I see within them little anecdotes here and there, and you can see that the individual has got into a sort of flow when they're writing that and has got into more of a compulsion to write it within those little short paragraphs that have these little anecdotes in or these little humorous uh, tales in. And so 
then what we get is this curious union between you've started off writing it in a more conscientious, more, more forced manner, as in I'm writing this book, I'm doing this, and it's more of a kind of... I don't really want to use the word egoic because then we always get drawn into this idea of spirituality. Um, I just simply mean if I'm going to use that word more of a kind of nature of which I'm doing this, I'm forcing this. That's what I mean. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of another word that would be good to describe it. More of an industriousness. That somewhat describes it. Um so you have that in which the industriousness turns into a more flowing instinctual passion, instinctual compulsion to write. Now, is it the case that we should, if we are writing in an, in an artistic and a poetic way, is it the case that we should strive to be in the state of an instinctual flow with writing as much as possible and is it the case that we should ignore writing if we do not feel that we've got that feeling of deep passion for the writing as we're starting it this is something i'm going through at the minute and this is something i've been going through for a while of trying to only write when it really grabs me we come, up, we come across one main problem with this. I'm sure there's other problems that I could identify. But the one main problem with this is, does the motivation come back? Let's say you write for a while. And you're writing a book or you're writing an essay or whatever it may be. And you write a while, for a while and you flow. And every day you get up, because this is what I've done before... Every day you get up and you're flowing and it's instinctual and it's passionate and you're in clear a clear rhythm. Now, let's say one day that rhythm goes and you think, well, I think that maybe I should take a break. I've been in this rhythm for a while. I don't want to force it. I don't want to write in an incredibly forced way for, for this particular artistic piece of writing. It might might serve okay to do that if you're writing a more conscientious uh, piece of writing. But it, in the piece of writing that I'm doing that's maybe more soulful, more artistic, I don't really want to force it. So you don't force it. There's a main problem with this. Now, we have two elements to this problem or two ways of looking at this problem. The problem is, does the motivation come back? Now, we have one angle of this, which we can say, well, if you trust yourself, if you trust your own nature, the motivation will come back and you'll get into that flow again. And maybe after a week or so, you'll write again and you'll it'll naturally follow on. And that seems to me to be correct in one form, in the sense that it's happened to me quite a few times. And after a week or so, I've had that desire to get back into it. But we also have the other angle of, well, potentially it might not come back. It, it, maybe it won't come back. Maybe we're going to go on to something new. And of course, that's not a bad thing because we can say, well, naturally, I just went on to something new. Naturally, my writing took me on to a new idea or a new project. But if we think like that, we might get into the trap of having a thousand incomplete projects. And of course, many people do have a good few incomplete projects. In fact, quite a lot of incomplete projects. But if we're to always think like that, then we may, may and again, it's may, it's not exact, but we may have many, many incomplete projects. So then we get back onto the idea of, well, okay, we, we, we know that maybe this instinctual flow is particularly good and maybe is particularly desired for an artistic piece of writing. But maybe it comes as 
We have the instinctual flow to begin with when we first begin the project. It maybe comes out of a very, very deep, passionate desire to start this project. And then we'll get a good few weeks of being really in that flow. And, you know, especially if you can really, if you're really interested in what you're doing and if you really get behind it, you will have a good few weeks of that. But then maybe it's interesting or it's a good idea to pair that forced nature of writing when you start off. Um, for example, let's say you've you've lost that instinctual flow and then you need to start off again in terms of you need to start back up with the writing. Then maybe when you start up again, you do start up in a more forced manner because it's that forced manner that then leads you back into the instinctual flow after maybe a page or two of writing. Maybe less than that for some people, maybe more than that for some people, but around that. And so then that specific forced element of writing that is maybe more generative in the setting of conscientious writing or scientific writing and that maybe is frowned upon a little bit within artistic writing is actually the very thing that got you back into that raw, passionate flow that is, for most people, considered quite a, a good attainment of writing and the way in which to write. So then we can't really, to, some, to, to any real degree, berate that idea of the forced starting of writing. And we can think to ourselves, well, actually, it's necessary to attain that more instinctual flow. And therefore, is that then a, a good standard of writing? Is that the way in which we do writing? Is that how we do writing? And we can say, well, it's along the right lines in a certain manner of speaking. Although we do come across a problem here of if we start up from a fourth nature and a piece of artistic writing, and if we do get back into the flow after a page or two of writing, maybe then we stop after a while again and then start up again in a fourth nature, and then it repeats itself once more or twice more in the same fashion. What we're going to get potentially is a page or two here or there of writing that is more forced until you get into that more flowing, spontaneous, natural sense of writing where words place themselves on the page quite nicely, quite spontaneously and, and also quite rightly as well from a, a more creative unconscious force who is that i don't think that's an incredibly powerful argument against it because generally when you read back your writing even if let's say you have forced it at the start you've forced yourself back into it you still generally find a flow quite quickly and those early points in which you have forced it, they flow on to the part in which you've managed to get more spontaneity back quite well and quite easily. So I don't think there's too much of, a, of an issue with that ideology in writing, let's say. Now, how do we know that an instinctual flow or a spontaneous flow, a flow from some sort of unconscious creativity, is the particularly right way of writing? Unfortunately, we don't know that. We don't know that. All we can say and all we can judge by is the production of artistic expression based on that creative force and based on that spontaneity as compared 
with those creative expressions that aren't based on that and that are based on more forced um, experience. And what we see time and time again, and this is quite conclusive, is that that art and that artistic expression, not only in writing, but in uh, obviously artwork itself, in the artwork of of the artist, in terms of pottery, in terms of uh, paintings, in terms of drawings, all that sort of stuff, in terms of film, in terms of YouTube content, in terms of uh, music videos, all that sort of stuff. The best music videos, the best pottery, the best artwork, and also the best uh, writing often comes from that creative force flowing through the individual. Now, we also do have a dimension of experience in which we have this union of the more rule-based, rigid nature and also the spontaneity of the creative force. So there are paintings out there, there is artwork out there, there is writing out there, which follows a set of rules, but also is very spontaneous. And... When we get that pairing, something interesting happens as well. And what that essentially is, is a a directional attitude towards this creative unconscious force in which the imagination flows through you as a directing vessel and you are the directing vessel in the form of the rule or the form of the um, producing something with a set of rules. And so the creativity gets placed in reality in a very, very interesting way, which is that of a beautiful spontaneity that has been placed in a specific direction because of rules. And that's a very, very... Well, it's a very, very antithetical remark, really. It's a very, very antithetical idea. But it works. And it's a very paradoxical idea, but it works. And we seem to see this with a lot of artwork. When we pair this kind of ideas of rules with the unconscious creative force, we get something that we can understand as as good. Now, let's go into this in a slightly different way as well. So, or from, from a slightly different offshoot. So... When we're talking about the creative force and when we're, when we're writing and when we're getting into this instinctual flow with writing, we can often leave behind rules. Now, let's look at that for a second. So if we are writing and if we're leaving behind rules specifically, then, of course, the writing is quite good. Um, it's not necessarily bad in a specific way because it flows from a creative force but there's something to be desired in its structure and its ability to include proper grammar include things in the correct places as well if you have a piece of writing that you're just flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing with it tends to become less comprehensible to people. And although it may have flow, and it, although it may be directed from some sort of unconscious creative force, it doesn't tend to be able to help the reader understand what you're saying. So then we get to an interesting understanding that the rules of language or the rules of of writing allow an individual to understand in a higher manner that spontaneity of which has come from a creative instinctual flow of which you're writing down on the page almost as if something's animating you. 
Because if you just did that, or when you just do that, it doesn't fit quite well. And as I said, we see this in poetry. If I write a poem, if I have some imaginations or some fantasies, and I write a poem, just solely based on those fantasies, and just write down the things I've seen, and maybe just do it in a little bit of a, a slightly poetic manner, let's say, then it's okay, but it still remains a little bit flat. But if I put in certain minor rules, oh, I'm going to put a rhyme in here, and I'm going to place these stanzas in separate to one another in this amount of lines, or I'm going to go for this specific angle, let's say. I'm going to tailor it in just this subtle, specific manner. Then it starts to just lift the poetry a little bit. Those, those minor little rules that you've started off with, to think, oh, I'm just going to do it in this particular manner. Those lift the poetry and lift the creativity. It doesn't diminish it, it lifts it. And so then we think, well, in poetry, we that's how we do it. We don't think, well, I've got all these fantasies, I'm just going to blurt it out onto the page, because it would just be, it would be certainly, in a, in a sense, creative, because, of course, we have a creativity, a raw, spontaneous creativity, from what you've seen in your imagination, and what you've placed on the page. But this is why doing something like a, a, a nonsense literature or rhyming style with imaginative poetry is is a brilliant rule to use to direct the spontaneity and creativity of it. The ability to put your imaginative stories that you imagine in your mind into rhyming verse allows a flow it allows a humour, and it allows a bringing together of the creativity in a way in which elevates it, and in a way in which allows people to understand it and to flow with it even more. So that's why a lot of people who do the nonsense literature poetry, and obviously the early people who did it, you know, sort of Edward Lear, Dr. Zeus, that's why they have adopted that sort of style because it allows for that kind of understanding and it elevates the poetry. It makes it better. It makes it more juicy. As I would say, it, it gives it that juicy little morsel that we can't even describe, but we can only describe in a sound that is something like... like that. And that's good poetry when we have that juicy little morsel that we can only describe in that sound. If you have to describe that juicy morsel in anything more than that sound within, well, or after you've read a specific poem, then the poem really isn't that good. When I've read Charles Bukowski, uh, I always say his name wrong, Charles Bukowski, it's because I always associate him with uh, Chuck out of the Spy series, um, who's, his name is Charles Butowski, uh, and I get them two mixed up. But Charles Bukowski, I can hardly even say that as well, let alone bloody pronounce it, but I can hardly even say it. Um, but when I've listened to some of his poems on YouTube, immediately I've got this emotional hit, this emotional feeling. It doesn't need any words to describe it. If anything you're going to describe it is it's got that taste, it's got that flavour. Or, of course, another way to describe it is just in, in tears, in emotion, in raw, passionate emotion. There are the two ways to describe it. It's either that, ooh, that was, you know, that was good. But you don't need to say that was good, of course. Or it's just pure and raw emotion. Um... So that's what we have to do when we when we talk about poetry. Now, style is very, very hard. Style is something that is... Um, 
I don't particularly think I've fully found my style yet. I think I've found it more with poetry. I'm closer to a style with poetry, but particularly with writing or with writing essays or books, I don't really think I've found my style yet. And if I were to critique my book writing, it would be that it doesn't utilise the rules of grammar and it doesn't, it isn't structured enough, my writing, in terms of my book writing. In fact, it's terribly unstructured and it's very, very, you could say partially stream of consciousness, but it's not quite to that level. It's still structured but uh, to a level that's not quite, obviously, as unstructured as stream of consciousness. But it's not incredibly structured. It's very, very instinctual, flowing onto the page. And, uh, and so I would critique my writing in such a way. Now, we could say, well, that comes into a certain style. Well, yes, it can do. But there's also ways of structuring yourself, even if you do have a, a style somewhat like that, so that then it just gives it a bit more elegance. It just gives it a bit more direction and it elevates it once more again, just like with the poetry. So I would say that finding your style, for one, is a very, very long process. I think that really... If I'm being very, very honest, and it's hard to say this because I know that when I say this to myself, I've, I'm automatically affirming to myself that I've got a long way to go before I find any element of my style. And that's hard to accept because I like to think that I've already, in some regard, done it, attained some sort of style and got there and all the rest of it. Uh, but such thinking in any sort of extreme capacity of thinking you've got there or you've attained something is not really conducive to success because it means that you'll rest on your laurels or you'll be quite lazy because you'll think well I've got there whereas if you think you're always not quite there you've always got something to strive for and you've always got something to look forward to because if we're to attain an ultimate success that means by default that um, we've we've got nothing else to do so it would be much more generative for everyone to always believe that they've not attained it completely, whatever it may be, so that then they get the happiness and they get the excitement of wanting to chase it still. But I think really it takes quite a number of books before, maybe not quite a number of books, but certainly a handful of books before you attain any sort of idea of your style. With some people it's possible Maybe they've had quite a good education and all the rest of it. And so it's possible that maybe on their first book, they're actually quite good and they've pinned down their style pretty well because of all the education they've had prior and maybe they know themselves quite well and stuff like that. But generally, it would take a few books. Now, with poetry specifically, I think really it takes about 200 poems to... And again, it's an arbitrary number because it really depends on different people and can you really allocate an arbitrary number to it or a number to it? Probably not, but I'm just doing it for the sake of, well, it's interesting to allocate a number to it and to speculate in that way. But I would say it takes probably about 200 poems until you think, well, I've got somewhere where I feel like my sort of style here um, and as I say I think I'm approaching that but I don't think I've I just don't think I've quite got there yet um, and in the process of doing 200 poems or so maybe a bit more maybe a bit less but in the process of doing those you're exploring and you're thinking well I'll try the haiku I'll try the prose I'll try the nonsense literature I'll try the uh, romanticism, you know, all these different things and you're experimenting and you're then able to get to um, and refine 
over that time period some things that you like and you take little bits from here and there and you, you curate your own style. You don't create your own style, but you curate your own style. And that style need be something that fits your personality and it need be something that is to some degree fresh. Because otherwise, what's the point? If it's not fresh, it's not... To, to some degree, it, it needs to be fresh. Because, of course, there's nothing new under the sun. We all know this. But if you curate out of loads of different styles of poetry or loads of different ideas within poetry, your own style, then it's fresh to a certain degree, at least. Um, it's kind of like... I don't know. You get some pasta... And, and you've not cooked it before or anything in terms of that specific pasta. You put it in the pan and you cook it and you put some veg in with it afterwards and all the rest of it. And then you put half of it away. And then the next day you get it out and then you end up cooking it up again. But you, but you add some new stuff into it. And maybe you put some new sort of sauce on it or something like that if you can. Then it it's fresh in a way, but it's not fresh in a way. And that's like curated poetry. You take all different elements of different peoples and also different, more so different styles of poetry, but you can also naturally uh, end up gaining certain nuances from different people and using them in your own way. Um, and you take all this from the different styles and the different people and you kind of curate it into your poetry. And that's exactly like the pasta. You're creating something slightly fresh from something that's already been used. Um, so that's kind of a way of which you, you do it. And then you get to your style and you think, well, that's a style that I gravitate towards. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you will use this rigid set of rules that you've kind of formulated um, from your kind of foray into poetry and into looking into different poets and different styles all the time. You're not going to use that all the time, but and you're certainly going to be able to use different styles and vary things, but that's the style in which you then take on board the most and that if anyone would know about you as a poet, that's the style that they know you for. And and that's kind of your creative addition to poetry. And as I say, it's nothing more really than a cu curation of different other things from, from different other uh, styles and different other people that has just come together in, in your unique expression of it, in a sense. So I think I'm going to, I'm not going to talk for too much longer. I often say that and I end up talking for at least another half an hour. You might get 15, 20 minutes out of me this time, but I probably won't do half an hour. Um, so I think writing is a hard one. I do think writing is a hard one. I think that if you're a writer, you are a writer. That's a... a, a an attribution that I would make to my own philosophy of writing. I think you can teach writing. That's not, to, I, I don't want to say that just because you're a writer, you're a writer, it doesn't mean you can't be taught to be a writer. I do think you can be, but I think there are writers out there who are just, the way their brain works, they are writers and they have to write. And all writers say this, all writers know that you have to write and you can't not write. Whatever it may be, whether it be little things in your phone notes on one day or whether you're doing a book one day or whether you're doing an essay or whether you're doing poetry, whatever it is, you've got to be writing something practically every day. So I do think that, you know, if you're a writer, you are a writer um, and that's just how it is. But there's certain people who can be taught writing and can do it to a certain degree. But if really, if you're a writer, I mean, if you are a writer, you are going to write every day and you're going to have that compulsion to write. And so therefore, just quite naturally in that, it is, there is a flow and there is a, uh, there is nature within that. 
Uh, and so this idea of forcing things doesn't need to matter too much in the idea that, of course, you have those compulsions, those natural daily compulsions for writing anyway. And if that's the case, as I say, it's quite natural. So writing is one of those things that we we do and that we just continue to do. And if that's the case, I think that it should be like that. I think that if we have the compulsion to write, we should write. I think that if we want to continue to write, that's how it should be. And I think some element of flow with it is always good and should always be pursued to um, a certain degree as well and should be uh, explored to a certain degree. I think really... I was going to actually cover as well the philosophy of reading, so I should cover that. But before I do, I have got a few other minor thoughts that I've just realised. So, what about the idea of writing and using overly lavish words, or or even just big words, just writing using big words? Well, we've got to be careful of this, and this is something that I myself has prob- have probably had bigger battles with than most people. This idea that it's nice to write with big, juicy words, and to put things in your writing like splendiferous, or like um, neologism, or like... Uh, I don't know, what's another good word? Let me have a think. Typify. It's not a big word, but it's a word that is, isn't really used that much in common speech. So, therefore, it's a word that has the potential to be learned and to be utilised in writing for a kind of way of highbrow intellectualism or pseudo-intellectualism, in the sense of you use the words just to sound, ooh, isn't my writing good? Ooh, isn't my writing all this? Ooh, look, I've used this big word here. Isn't that cool? And so you string along loads and loads of words that are very big and very powerful, and you you do that so to appear intelligent. So it's a a pseudo-intellectual thing. Um... We have to be careful of that. It's what I've done in certain books. Certainly what I've had battles with in poetry. So we do. We have to be careful of that. Now the only way to fully get over that, paradoxically, as it as it may be, is to do it. Is to actually involve yourself in it and to really try and learn a lot of big words and to really get to grips with it and and then use them in your writing in a terribly, uh, intolerably intellectual manner. That actually isn't that intellectual, it's just you trying to colour your work with some sort of um, pride and a scholarly pride and pride in intelligence and all that sort of stuff. But we do have to partake in it. And you may be thinking, well, why do we need to partake in it? Because that, surely that's wrong to do that, surely we should just cut it off. But the thing is, if you have such an association, like myself or or like maybe others out, certain other people out there, not everyone of course, but certain other people out there, if you have such an association with doing something like that, and you're a little bit unconscious of it, you need to give yourself the... you You need to give yourself the ability to do that and be kind to yourself I think, well, okay, so I have something within me that is basically a neurotic tendency. And so to be able to get over that, I need to feel as if I've experienced it. I need to feel as if I've lived it. Because there's no getting over uh, pseudo-intellectualism by simply just trying to run away from it. It's going to seep out in your writing here or there. It's going to seep out in your experience here or there. It's going to also direct your behavior here and there as well. Um, so you need to live it, you need to go to the extreme of it, and you need to think, well, 
I'm going to put this in my writing, I'm going to learn all these new words and I'm going to place these things in my writing in a certain way and it's going to look big and it's going to look bold and how great everyone will think I am, how awesome this will be and how incredible this will be for myself and all the rest of it. And we need to pair that with a very, very curious idea. We need to pair this pseudo-intellectualism with a constant interrupting of it by other people in your life who are intelligent in a more pure manner of intelligence without any neurotic direction within their intelligence, within trying to be intelligent, but they're just naturally intelligent and they're lovely people and they're kind and they don't flaunt their intelligence or anything like that. But you need to pair this you being trying to be pseudo intellectual with being real with these real intelligent people in your life who are just lovely and nice and their true intelligence will start to annoy you and it'll start to get at you because you will always be striving for this kind of I want to make myself known as being this incredible intelligent being. And I want that to be known in my writing or in my uh, poetry or whatever it may be. Or even generally in your behavior. And all the while, while this is going on, it's building up uh, a folly within you. And it's building up sort of an extinction burst, if you will, in behavioral, behavioral terms. In which you're getting closer and closer to understanding the real horror of that pseudo-intellectualism that you've displayed in your writing, in your poetry, in your behaviour. And then it flips. And it starts to... You start to become slightly more aware and well-rounded within those attitudes. You're aware of the certain things that you do that maybe you weren't aware as aware of uh, previously within your intellectualism. Um, For example, the ways in which your pseudo-intellectualism directs your behavior and things like that in conversation. Uh, You're more aware of that. And so then you start can start to take conscious awareness of things and start to take stock and take note and take it into your own hands, your negative relationship with the intellect. And then you can stop it manifesting itself at that point because you've tried to live it out. You have to give yourself the option of living it out. If you do not live out any sort of pseudo-intellectualism in such a way that manifests itself in such a way, then you're only just suppressing that that thing anyway. You're not being able to actually get it out and into the open and think, oh, I've got all that out. Imagine you've got a cyst on your body somewhere. When you, when they, have you ever seen the videos with cysts? For, they're, they're brilliant and horrible all at the same time. But when we cut open a cyst, all the gunk comes out, and then the cyst shrinks, and then obviously goes away after after a little bit of time. And it's exactly the same with a complex or with pseudo intellectualism or whatever. Um, you need to cut that open, let it all come out. And then it will recede. But if you start to just suppress it, in the analogy with a cyst, if you just let it, well, I'm just going to let it sit there, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to stay there. It's just going to be the same way it is. In fact, it might get worse. You know, let's say it was a benign cyst. Maybe it isn't benign after a a few years or whatever. So um, we have to allow ourselves for that. And that's, the way to get over that in our writing. And again, that's going to take a while. That's going to take a few books. That's going to take a lot of experience. That's going to take potentially therapy if that's if it it's a prominent thing. If it isn't a prominent thing and it's just more of a low-level thing, then of course it just takes experience and time. But if it's a higher level thing or a higher grade thing, then therapy might be might be a warranted thing. And uh, so that's something that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of that. 
we need to be aware of just being able to use words and use language and use writing as a vessel for communication. And naturally within your writing or within your speech, because you've got this newfound lexicon of words, you're using them anyway. You're just naturally, you naturally have a thought to use a particular word. For example, just then, I learned the word lexicon from my degree a few months ago. I'd heard it before, but I didn't know what it meant. And so then, a minute ago, I had the thought to use that word, and so I used that word. And so it's natural that anyway, the intellect that you have gained, and that you can, if you can overcome the pseudo-intellectualism, which partly for me is still present and has to be move through still for myself slightly. But if you can slowly overcome that, you're naturally going to place words because you've got a, a large quantity of words at your disposal. You're naturally going to place those words in your language and in your writing that are, shall we say, lovely, bubbly language. Um... And that's not to say that any other smaller words are, are um, or should be cast out, let's say. Because all of the smaller words make the connecting bridges of which the larger words wouldn't hold any meaning in a sentence or in a paragraph. So the smaller words and the connecting words and the conjunctives and all this sort of stuff allow us to formulate language or formulate true writing, sentences, paragraphs, you know, phrases, all this sort of stuff. So, um, it's quite natural that that's going to be the case anyway, and, that, and those words are going to bleed into your writing, but they're going to bleed into your writing in a natural and spontaneous way, instead of in a way that's forced, instead of in a way that's, let me put my stamp on this, let me show my intelligence, let me have this. Um, and so that has to be moved through and then you get to that experience and you only slowly get to that experience. It's gradual to get to that experience. Now reading, let me just touch on this for a little bit longer or a little bit of, of the time we've got left. So, Reading is an interesting one. There's many, many ways you can get into reading as a folly. So you can read and you can read to get knowledge. And that's partially good and partially a folly. It's a folly in the sense of if you read just to get knowledge to try and get somewhere, to try and one-up someone or something. That's the folly. We all go through that with reading. A lot of us go through that with reading. Some of us more than others. And if you've got this pseudo-intellectual side, you're going to go through that with reading a lot more than others who haven't got that pseudo-intellectual side. Because those who utilize intelligence in a natural way and don't have any exper negative experiences with intelligence... Um, then they're going to just naturally read, they enjoy reading, they love learning, that's that, and so they don't have this, let's say, this neurotic compulsion. Those with pseudo-intellect or things like that, have, or, or even a, an obsessive-like uh, intellect, which is tied in one way to the desire for, for intelligence and for dominance, um... They're going to read for the folly side of it of, um, well, I, I'm going to get this knowledge and I'm going to read. And, and, and the problem is with that is it always strikes you whenever you do it or whenever anyone else does it. Is it strikes you as hard, as not an easy way to read. 
as something that you do not for fun, but just because you're like, well, I'm, I've got to read this. And you see the, the utilization of language there that I, I, I said, well, I've got to read this. I've got to read this. Well, no, you haven't got to read anything. There's no needing to read any single book in your entire life. Now, of course, the idealism or the projection of ideals onto people in the past that I've touched upon before can come into this. Well, you could say, well, Nietzsche or Jung or Watts or whoever it is you idolize specifically, I don't know, um, Zizek, Zizek or um, Peterson or um, some actors, you know, or whatever it may be, I don't know, it could be, it could be anyone, anyone at all. Oh, well, they read loads, or maybe you idolise Albert Einstein, or you idolise one of the big physicists, Brian Cox, and, oh, they must have read loads, uh, and I bet they've read all these books and all the rest, oh, I know that this person's read this book, and so that comes into it as well. Oh, I need to read this because they're the people in my field. And if I've not read all of the stuff that they've read, then suddenly I'm unworthy. Suddenly I'm not enough. Suddenly uh, it doesn't, I can't be, a, a, I can't have the privilege of labeling myself as whatever it may be, a philosopher, a psychologist, or whether it be an engineer or an actor or a physicist or whatever. Now that's a load of crap. That's absolutely a load of crap. For one, because there's new books coming out all the time and you naturally may have read certain books that they would have never even had a chance to read. So it's crap in that dimension. But it's also crap because the intellect is more than reading. Someone who has intelligence doesn't necessarily need to read a lot of things because they observe the world in a way that others don't. And so a lot of the things in books, they already know just by observation of the world that they've done by thinking and by exercising their intellect over a number of years. And so this is why many intellectuals, when they read things, maybe books from 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, maybe even just books that were published a year ago, they generally get this familiarity with the concepts in them because they've already thought about it in their, their life and they've observed it empirically. And then they think, oh, I, I remember, I know that because I've seen that in my life. Um, and so, therefore, they, in a way, they don't need to read it because they already know it. I've had this a lot with philosophy books. I've read a lot of philosophical concepts and I thought, Oh, is that what that... I've already had that idea, or I've thought about that. And we all get this, everyone gets this. If you're fairly intelligent, you get... You don't even really need to be intelligent. I mean, some things are just very, very common sense, and you can read them and you realise, oh, yeah, I've had that, you know. Um, but if you're reading specifically philosophy books that are generally considered a little bit harder in certain circumstances, certain books from certain people and you're somewhat intelligent in the way of intelligence that specializes for more theoretical knowledge than practical knowledge, because of course, everyone's intelligent in a certain way. And there's many, many people out there who are practically intelligent that I just become in awe of. I think to myself, well, you know, I've got a desk here. I couldn't make that desk. I, give me 10 years, I couldn't make that desk. There's no way. But someone can knock it up in a few hours, an afternoon. They could knock up this desk in an afternoon. And I think, how the hell do they do that? So, of course, they, everyone's intelligent in different ways. But if we're talking about a theoretical level of intelligence, those people who are fairly intelligent in that way will read the philosophy books or the psychology books or whatever it may be, and they will automatically get a familiarity with the concepts and think, oh, I've thought about that. So you don't really, there's none of, it doesn't need to be that you need to read X amount or you need to do X amount or you need to have X amount of things or anything like that. Naturally, just, intelligence just is more of a, 
in a way, it's more of a passive thing because it you can observe the world in different ways than other people can if you're intelligent without having read anything or without even having the knowledge that you have such an ability to do so. Um, and so you can f think about intelligence in a more passive way like that. And it simply, your brain uses the experiences around you to formulate your own ideology, which happens to be very, very similar to a lot of ideologies that people have wrote in books over a number of years. But it's just that you've not decided to write it down or you've not decided to, or you've not thought that you need to specifically read those people. Maybe that's particularly correct because you already know that in your own mind or you already have that experience or you just don't know that they've wrote it down in the same way because you've not read the books that's all it really is now we've got to make sure that we read for the correct way and i would say that unlike writing i don't think it's as complex reading in reading in the correct way i think there is more of a of a split the split being you read because you think you need to and it's a pseudo-intellectualism thing or, or or not just a pseudo-intellectual thing but an intellectual sort of desire in which is not the not the right intellectual desire but actually it's it's more of a I need loads of knowledge I need to get the you know it's more of a kind of neurotic um, intellectual desire so we want to read because we want to gain knowledge. And we want to gain knowledge because we want to gain knowledge. We want to understand the world in a new way. That's the basis. That's what we want. When we strip back any neuroticism, when we strip back any pseudo-intellectualism, that's what we really want. That's the base, very honourable desire. We want to learn about the world. So instead of us reading all these reams of books because we have we understand that these people in the past have read them and we understand that, oh, maybe I should read them uh, or maybe it would be good for me to read this variety of things, we should say to ourselves, we should ask us this, ourselves the simple question of, well, let's not think I need to get anywhere. And let's imagine that I don't need to read any books in my entire life. But if I so choose, I can. So what book would I like to read right now? And then maybe something springs to mind. Oh, I'd like to read this book on Greek myths. Or oh. I'd like to read this book on carpentry. Oh, I'd like to read this book on engineering. And so you read that book. But you don't read that book as in a neurotic way because you've let go of that to an extent. And it is a very, very intuitive and very balanced process this as well because you can easily fall back into that neurotic tendency you see but you read that book and you read it for what it's worth and you get engrossed in that book and you love it and then you understand it better you see this neurotic compulsion to read actually impedes your ability to understand because you'll read the books for the egoic fervor of reading the books for that passion of just, I need knowledge, I want to read these books, I'm, I need to get as good as these people in the past who have read all these books. But you won't really take it in because you're always thinking about the next book. You always say, oh, well, I better get on to that next book. Oh, I've only got X amount of days in this year. Oh, I've only got X number of years in this decade. Oh, I've only got X number of years till I'm dead. And I need to make sure that by this age, I want to be in this position and to be in this position I need to read X number of books well it's totally neurotic thinking and if you just go along that idea of picking up one book 
I mean, that's the thing that I want to read, and then reading it. Then you'll probably end up getting through it quite quickly, because you're more engrossed in it. You'll, as I say, you'll be more interested in it, so you'll remember more stuff, because generally, when we are interested in something, um, it'll get cemented in the hippocampus more as a memory. Well, it'll be there as a memory more because we've had uh, uh, emotional reactions when we're reading that book more firmly cemented than if we had just tried to get through it. And then those emotions are going to be prevalent within our memory and within our um, brain and within our recall as well. And so therefore we'll, we'll remember more of it and it'll be, it'll be, it'll be better. So that's what we do, and that's how we we move forward, and that's how we slowly process um, and, and and go forward through life. And uh, you'll find, as I say, or you may find, that you end up reading more books that way than in another way. Now, it's incredibly, incredibly hard to get over an erotic tendency of what I like to call a, a judging tendency or a, a temporal judging tendency which is a a judgment of time this happens in a fair few neuroses and uh, neuroses is neuro, neuroses there we go fair few neuroses where people get this obsession and this clinging to time and temporality in which they need to categorize and organize everything within the context of time. And of course, naturally, if you're more associated with the uh, flight response, which obviously, of course, produces the reactions of anxiety physiologically, and of course, the chemicals get released in the bloodstream and all the rest of it, and the, the certain neurological reactions are happening as well uh, to release those chemicals, of course, you're going to want to judge things more. You're going to want to schedule your time more because that's a way of getting over the anxiety. You're going to want to make sure that you're out of that flight response that gives you all of those horrible feelings of anxiety physiologically as much as possible. And the way you do that is by fully organizing your life so that then you know what's going to happen. Because if you know what's going to happen, nothing can surprise you and nothing can therefore activate that fight or flight response that gives you those negative feelings. So, of course, quite naturally, someone who's neurotic is going to gain an, uh, an over-association in some cases or even in quite a few cases of wanting to organize their life. Now, it's not all the time that this happens in a neurosis. There are quite a lot of cases where this, this doesn't happen actually to the extent you would imagine or you would find with, with certain other people. And it really depends on just the unique experiences that people have had in life as well to get to that stage or not get to that stage uh, or that ability of, of utilising a judgement of time within their life and within their future. Um, but it is very, very hard to get over that judging factor of, of, a, of a neurotic tendency. And so you'll find that a lot of the time it may be that even upon reading books, you can get into that situation in which uh, you're wanting to get onto the next book, you're wanting to get onto the next book. And uh, it's very, very hard and it can be very, very hard to actually stop that neurotic tendency and it has to come over an, a very extended time period in life with of course getting familiarity with your own complexes and with your own unconscious and with your own psychology in general but it's also for experiences and through the dissolving of those complexes through the maturation of your psychology and experience you slowly get a more healthy re relationship with that judgment opposed to, let's say, some sort of spontaneity. And you're able to judge things less and you're able to do things in the, in the spur of the moment more without feeling that that activates your anxiety, that that actually makes you more anxious. 
Uh, and so when you have that dimension of experience and when you can open up to that instead of being closed off and trying to judge everything in your life of which you can't do anyway because things always pop up in life that surprise people but if you can do that then other dimensions of your life such as the pseudo-intellectualism whilst also combating those kind of neurotic tendencies at the same time can withdraw slightly and you can slowly over a long time period and a lot of work, uh, depending on the, the prevalence of these compulsions, get to a state in which you feel grounded more within yourself and feel as if you can let go to these things and experience life as you should. Well, not you should, but you would like to experience life rather than being pulled in a way by these compulsions. So I think that kind of does it on reading and I think that we should maybe just take note of reading and think about how we're going about it um, and just read for the love of reading and what we want to read. Fiction, non-fiction, science, philosophy or art or whatever it may be, whatever book we want to read, we read that. And we don't also have this neurotic compulsion of having tons and tons of books and then thinking well I've got all these books now and so you can see them on your shelf and so that reinforces in a way this neurotic tendency and you think well I've got all these books and I need to read them and, and all the rest of it I think that going too much or thinking even too much about that perfectly fine to have a lot of books on your shelf but trying to get out of that experience of, of thinking in a certain way about those books on your shelf. You know, that's something that we need to also get out of. So that then we can just be attentive to the present moment and what we're doing right now and what we're reading right now. And that allows us to read and enjoy it. So I think I'll leave it there anyway, guys. Thank you very much for watching this video. It's been another long one. Been an hour and 12 minutes, but I think I've covered there what I wish to cover with regards to my philosophy of writing and my philosophy of reading. It's not comprehensive. It's not a full idea of the philosophy of writing or philosophy of reading. Um, certainly there's things that we could expand on within the philosophy of language particularly. Um, but I didn't want to go into the generation of language or of speech rather, phone in production, all that sort of stuff. Because it's not particularly related to, well I mean it is in a way related to language, uh, writing of course. But it's not related to what I specifically wanted to talk about with regards to writing. I mean, it's a it's somewhat of a separate video as well. And the philosophy of language or... Uh, the psychology of language isn't an area I'm particularly interested in, um, although I understand that uh, it very well can be an interesting area for a lot of people, and I would love to find it more interesting than I do, but it's just that uh, there's certain things you just don't find interesting, isn't there, as much as uh, certain personalities find things interesting more than others. Um, and it is a shame because sometimes I wish that I could find everything interesting. Uh, I have that compulsion in me. I want to find everything interesting because it's uh, it'd be nice to learn about everything, you know, to understand so much and to observe the world in, in a way that's less um, prejudice against certain subjects and stuff and be as expansive as possible with your interest. Um, uh, but it's in that way, really, that our brains are discriminative in the sense of they give us certain interests and they block off other interests that we don't particularly enjoy that much. And it, and it is so that we need uh, 7 billion people, well, maybe not 7 billion people, but we need a good range of people on the planet to be able to facilitate our desires with all of these different subjects because... As an individual, you can never, your brain can never be on board or enjoy 
the experience of all subjects. Um, and so it, it's quite interesting that, actually. It's quite an interesting thought. Um, but no, the philosophy of language isn't something I'm majorly interested in. So um, I may discuss it at some point. Uh, but if I do, it probably won't be in an incredibly deep or detailed or technical way. Um, but anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. And I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon, guys.